So I, I think the way we would go is uh, to take the amendments that have been proposed in advance and post it and so that you're on notice of them. And, and of course, uh, the one that I mentioned is, is Peter Strauss, who is a senior fellow. Now, Peter can't make a motion, uh, but um, I know I'm going to recognize someone who can. I believe that's Phil Harder. And I, I think we can even have a seconder now in, in Cynthia Farina. So, uh, Phil, would you start us off and then turn, turn to Peter? Sure. My, uh, my primary reason for moving this is at age 70, I want to emphasize I'm not recognized as a senior. So I thought that was kind of a hoop. Anyway, the, uh, I, I think that the introductions were really terrific. And my main reason for doing this is I've, I've been involved in the standards process literally for 40 years, not the magic 30 that's been kicking around. When I, when I wrote a memo for the National Bureau of Standards and been involved in it ever since. It strikes me that throughout that period that, that the administrative law answer has been clear. You need the standards, they need to be free. On the other hand, there's this very practical ones that both of you emphasized as that kills the goose that lays the golden egg. And so we need, we need some, some sort of accommodation. So one of the things I wanted to do was sponsor Peters to, spot, to spark the debate among this group with a very practical and considerable insight to help us res resolve and move forward in what I hope is a continuing dialogue, because we ain't there yet. So if I can. You are now free to speak. Thank you. So uh, this is in so many ways a, a fine recommendation. And uh, the best practices that Emily has identified clearly are best practices uh, and ought to be followed and widely encouraged. The, the place where I stopped as an academic um, was at, wait a minute, the public can be required to pay for this rather than the agencies. I don't have any question that copyrights on some occasions ought to be paid for, but the way to encourage good bargaining, the way to encourage agencies really pushing standard setting organizations for the best possible outcome is for them to be carrying the payment freight. If agencies see that, well, it's somebody else that's paying the bill, they're less likely to do that. So I submitted previously some amendments that looked in that direction. I then had extensive conversations with Paul and John and other members of, of uh, the ACUS staff uh, that persuaded me that really the better thing to do was to try to emulate Walter Gellhorn uh, and see if we couldn't find a way of doing this good thing without taking a public position on the issue that the government someplace else has already taken, what I might think was the wrong position on, but doesn't matter. I'm not there. I'm here. Uh, and so this recommendation attempts to do that. Uh, it attempts to capture, I hope it does capture, uh, all of the positives in the recommendation as put. It's reorganized. It's reorganized for a couple of reasons. First, numbers one through three deal with proposals for rulemaking. As I say, no substantive change here except to identify this is about proposals for rulemaking. The reason for doing that is there is no statutory obligation of reasonable availability at the stage of proposals for rulemaking. But all of the transparency considerations, all of the e-government and e-rulemaking considerations push strongly in that direction. Um, maybe there's some mild strengthening, um, substitution of a couple of words. But mostly what this does is to bury the question of payment and who pays. That's what I'm intending to do. Then paragraph four deals with an issue that I think has just been dropped um, by the recommendation, but I think there's a way around that. The obligation that standards be reasonably available is a statutory obligation for enforcement by the Office of Federal Register. The Office of Federal Register has not revisited its regulations on this subject since EFOIA, since the Electronic Government Act, since the explosion of the Internet. It's time for them to do so. And when they do so, one of the things they'll find is that the principal reason for this 
statutory provision to keep bulk out of the Federal Register has disappeared. There's no longer any question about reasonable availability if stuff is on agency Internet websites. It's simply gone. So the only thing that's left is the question that I've tried to bury, whether if something's been incorporated by reference, it has to be paid for, and if so, by whom. And other than that, and turning this into a recommendation that it's the Office of Federal Register that ought to reconsider these matters, A, B, and C are directed at the Office of Federal Register. I think no change in the positives that the recommendation endorses. And then, well, do we have to wait for the Office of Federal Register to change that? No, ACUS ought to go ahead and agencies ought to go ahead and accomplish these good things on their own. I'll say one final thing. There are standards and there's regulations. And to some extent that I hope I've evaded, the recommendation confuses that. Circular A119, OMB's circular enforcing the National Technological Transfer Act, is only about standards. It's only about the sorts of things that we might ordinarily think of in guidance terms. Well, if you can produce something meeting the following physical tests, then you will have met the regulation that we have adopted. And the OMB document is very clear that it doesn't believe that incorporation by reference is required by the Technological Transfer Act for rules, for binding stuff of a more general character. So I try to evade this in a way, particularly because if you look at what the Administrative Procedure Act has to say about guidance, which this recommendation does not address, and I appreciate that, there is no reasonable availability qualification. The only qualification in the obligation of agencies to put their guidance into their electronic reading rooms is the protection of privacy. Nothing about reasonable availability. We don't have to decide that. I'll say again, I'm supportive of, I suppose, 90% of this recommendation. I hope the conference will agree simply to put aside the question of who pays and is payment tolerable. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take the matter under advisement.